All right. So we'll continue now where we had left off the other day. We were talking about the iteration period or what is the minimum average time that is required in order to process samples for a given DSP system, right? And the model that we are using or the representation that we are using in order to understand this is basically the data flow graph. But from our previous discussions, you can sort of understand that, you know, block diagram, signal flow graphs, data flow graphs, they're all substantially the same. They pretty much represent similar kinds of behavior, right? And how we can sort of uh, uh, interpret it in terms of one or the other is just a question of the exact details of how we are uh, analyzing the particular uh, uh, problem at hand, okay? So the example that we started with was the IIR filter and the data flow graph corresponding to this. So the equation corresponding to it once again just to recap was y of n equals a y of n minus 1 plus x of n. The data flow graph corresponding to this we assume there is a source. Uh, actually I am sorry uh, I need to correct this. Uh, Alright so you know this is the IIR filter but in order to first understand the iteration period a little bit better let's take a step back and go back to the FIR filter right because that was the one that we were studying at the end of the last session. So in the FIR filter the equation that we are implementing is y of n equals a x of n plus b x of n minus 1 plus c x of n minus 2 okay and the data flow graph corresponding to this is assumed to look like this I have a source that produces the x of n samples that output x of n basically goes into three multipliers I'll call them m0 m1 and m2 and the inputs to those are essentially one is a, the direct x of n input, the other is a one delayed input and the other is a two delayed input. The outputs of those multipliers in turn go to an adder. Okay. So this was assumed to be one possible data flow graph representation corresponding to this FIR filter. Okay. Now the discussion that we had last time was essentially sort of tending towards the thing that given that the source node by itself has no other dependency inputs, it can fire as many times as necessary right at the beginning. And based on that, can we sort of come up with what is the minimum possible average iteration period that we can usefully define for this data flow graph. Okay. So what I'm going to do is let's consider a uh, situation where I have unlimited hardware and therefore I'm going to assume that the firing process is going to look something like this at t equal to 0 s fires n times okay so that essentially corresponds to the firings s0 s1 etc up to s n minus 1 okay now let's draw what the data flow graph is going to look like at the end of this process. That is to say after S has fired n times, what does the data flow graph look like, right? And based on our definitions of what is happening within a data flow graph, essentially our understanding is n tokens are produced by S and deposited onto each of the output arcs or output edges. So what would it look like? It would essentially be something like the same S, M0, M1 and M2 like this feeding into the adder so at time equal to 0 if all that has happened is S fired n times what would I expect the state of the output arcs to look like how many tokens do I expect on each output arc 
from S to M0, how many tokens do I expect over there? How many were there to start with? There were no tokens on the S to M0 arc. Okay, but after S has fired n times, I should see n tokens on it. Okay, so I'll write that as n d. Okay, so keep in mind this is not n times d or n into d. It is just n delay elements or tokens. Right, that d is just a symbol to represent a token. Okay, what about the arc S to M one? It already had one d to start with. So after these n firings, it will now be n plus 1 d. And the arc s to m2 therefore would be n plus 2 d. Okay. All right. So far so good. Now what I'm going to assume is that I can continue firing, right? So s can continue to fire. But I'm going to assume that there was some limit for whatever reason after firing this n times, I decided to stop. Okay, so S doesn't fire anymore, right? Now at t equal to 1, what are the possible things that can be fired? From what I can see, what are the things that have tokens? Of course, S can fire at any point in time because it has no dependencies, but I leave that aside for now. It has already fired n times. Let me just stop there. Okay. Now M0, how many times can it fire? It has n tokens sitting on its input. What does one firing of M0 mean? It means basically take one token out of the input, multiply it by that constant A, which is whatever M0 is supposed to be multiplying by and deposit a token on the output. That token will be A times whatever it read from the input. Okay. Which means that if N tokens are sitting on the input, it can fire N times. Okay. M1 can fire N plus one times. M2 can fire N plus two times. But I'm going to assume instead that all three of them m0, m1 and m2 fire n times. Okay, so that basically becomes the sequence m00, m01 up to m0, n minus 1, m10, m11 up to m1, n minus 1 and m20, m21 up to m2 n minus 1 okay which means that after this process my data flow graph now looks like this I have consumed n tokens from the m0 input. Therefore, how many tokens are left on the s to m0 arc? <coughs> 0. Okay, nothing is remaining over there. But now there will be correspondingly n tokens on the m0 to a arc. Okay. I had n plus 1 on s to m1. I consume n of them. Therefore, I will be left with 1 over here and n tokens on the m1 to a arc and similarly s to m2 i will have two tokens remaining over here and n on the output arc right and if i take this further then what i can say is at t equal to 2 now once again s can fire m1 and m2 can also fire m0 is the only one at this point that does not have any input tokens and that cannot therefore cannot fire okay but i'm not interested in that i basically want to finish n iterations of this data flow graph therefore what i'm going to say instead is that a is now going to fire n times okay so at t equal to 2 a fires n times those will be the activations a0 a1 up to a n minus 1 and the resulting graph will basically look like 
since I have not drawn an output arc for A, therefore there is nothing onto which A is going to send its outputs. In practice, of course, what is happening is A is generating some output, it's the filtered output, okay, which is going to go somewhere. It's just that as far as I'm concerned within this data flow graph, there is nothing to represent over there. What this means is that I'm now back to my starting point. or the starting data flow graph, the DFG, right? So after going through n iterations, I've essentially come back to my starting point, okay? How long did I take? How many time steps have I taken to finish this computation? Three, t equal to zero, t equal to one, t equal to two, right? So essentially what I have is in three time steps, n iterations of the DFG completed. So the average iteration period equals 3 divided by n plus 2, uh, sorry, by n, 3 divided by n, right? So as n tends to infinity, the iteration period tends to 0. Okay, So what this means in other words is if I have the ability to process n samples at a time for each of the operations, the first is the source, then there are the three multipliers and then there is the adder. For each of those if I have sufficient hardware that I can process n samples at one time instant. It means that based on my dependencies at least, there is nothing preventing me from finishing the entire computation within three time steps. And therefore the average time per iteration of this data flow graph will tend to zero. Okay, for sufficiently large values of n. Okay. All right. Now to contrast this, let's go back to the case of the IIR filter. Over here the data flow graph looked like this, S, right? So what is happening over here? The output of A is the Y, right? The filtered output. One delayed version of it is what goes as input to the M, which is basically multiplying by the coefficient small a, right? And that value is being fed back into the adder, okay, which is also in turn adding whatever it gets from the source, which is x of n, right? Let's go through the same process, right? So at t equal to 0, s fires n times, okay? So I have s0, s1 up to s n minus 1. What does the graph look like as a result? S I have n times d sitting over here. Okay. All right. At I could have also fired the m, but it doesn't matter. I'm just going to sort of take one step back and say you know, all right, let's just separate it out, right? At t equal to 1, let's say m fires, how many times can it fire? It can fire only once, right? So it basically only m0 can fire over here. What ends up happening as a result is, I have this n delay sitting over here. It's just that the one token that was at the input of the m now comes to the output of m. Okay, at t equal to 2. Now m cannot fire anymore. S of course can fire at any point, but I've already generated n output token, so I'm not going to really bother with it at this point. 
right a can fire again it can fire only one time because it has n tokens sitting on one of the inputs from source but on the other input which is coming from m there is only one token sitting over there okay and my graph now looks like this d comes at the output over here what about the s to a h it becomes n minus 1 Okay, I can take this forward at t equal to 3 m that is m1 fires. Right, and at t equal to 4 a1 fires. and this becomes n minus 2 okay so you can see where I am heading with this essentially it becomes very clear that in order to finish off those n tokens that were generated or in, our, in order to bring the graph back to its original state the s to a arc has to go down to 0 for that to happen I basically need to go through this process n times right n times a has to fire n times m has to fire and they can happen only one after the other okay so this is essentially what will happen after a total of 2n plus 1 clock cycles right time steps for n iterations of the data flow graph which means that the iteration period average becomes 2n plus 1 by n which tends to 2 ok so hopefully by now it is clear that this is not just something that happened because of the way that I decided to execute things this is in some ways a fundamental difference between the IIR and the FIR filters right in the case of the FIR filter there are no backward dependencies anything <coughs> once computed right is never going to affect anything that came before it the flow is entirely in one direction from the source I process 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 until I get the output okay by the way the direction that I am talking about now has nothing to do with how I am drawing it on the screen right it's more to do with the direction of the flow itself right it is unidirectional it is always going from input towards the output Whereas in the case of the IIR filter, there is a so-called feedback connection, right? Which means that when the multiplier executes, the output that it generates is then being used by the adder, which in turn was generating output that was being used by the multiplier, okay? Now, something similar you are already familiar with from the context of digital synchronous circuits, right? Essentially, if you have a feedback loop of this sort, right, that is to say you have some combinational logic AND gates, OR gates and so on, and if you ever connect the output of one of the gates back to something that it originally depended on, that's something called a combinational loop, which is not allowed to exist in a normal synchronous digital circuit. You can put something together of that sort, there's nothing physically preventing you from doing it, 
in fact you may want to do it if you want to construct a latch or something else of that sort but in general when you are trying to make a valid synchronous digital circuit that's not an allowed connection in the same way you can see that if i do not have any delays any tokens any initial values when there is a cycle like this in my data flow graph i will run into problems right because my adder would have been depending on the multiplier output the multiplier would have been depending on the adder output without any initial conditions without any difference in delay right and that would essentially have led to something called deadlock okay so what we are going to do now is see if we can generalize this idea and find out what is the actual iteration period bound that you are going to end up with for a more general data flow graph before that i want to take a moment to sort of talk about this model of computation that we are using over here okay so we are essentially using something that is based on a model of computation that's called the kan process network or the kpn model right named after the person who originally proposed it right the idea behind kan process networks is at its core very simple all that it says is supposing there are two computational elements a and b and whatever is generated as output by a is then going to be consumed by b we assume that they are going to communicate through something called a fifo channel okay a fifo is essentially a first in first out buffer okay and implementing fifos there are multiple ways of doing it you can sort of imagine what is happening over here if you want a first in first out buffer essentially all that you are saying is the first data that i put into this buffer should also be the first data that the other side is going to read out okay in terms of data structures right what's the name that you would give for something like this it's a queue right it's a first in first out queue okay in data structures there is also another alternative which is called the last in first out what is that called a stack okay so in this case we are not going to talk about stacks at all because in terms of hardware especially stacks are at least they don't fit within this model of computation that we are trying to use okay the first in first out buffer on the other hand is perfect it fits exactly with the notion of what we mean when we are talking about a signal processing algorithm right we have a certain signal which is coming in from somewhere i need to perform certain operations on it do some computations with it and then forward it somewhere else for further computation okay this is sometimes also called a streaming model right or sometimes called com computation with streams right so what we are sort of saying the word intuitively what you can assume when you hear the word stream is there is a continuous flow of certain kinds of information which is going from the input to the output okay so in this case right now if i have just two computational elements a and b the assumption is that they communicate by means of this fifo buffer okay any time that a computes something it generates an output and puts it into that fifo buffer and b can then read from it and do something with it okay which fits exactly with our notion of tokens in the data flow graph okay so in the data flow graph i was marking those d's on the edges and saying okay these are tokens how would you implement it exactly in terms of communicating fifo buffers okay so now you can sort of understand what that edge over there means when i sort of say that there is an edge from you know m to a right or rather from a to m and then another edge from m to a what it means is there is a fifo buffer between that adder and the multiplier right and that fifo buffer how big is it how many data elements can it contain we don't know yet but it should contain at least one i mean it can store at least one data element okay and what happens is the multiplier therefore just has to look 
at the FIFO buffer? Is something present over there? If it is, it can pull that out, multiply it and write that into its output FIFO buffer. Okay. So keep in mind over here that if I, for example, have something of this sort, I need to have at least one delay element over there, one token. But the FIFOs themselves, I could have FIFOs on both edges. Right? That's just an implementation issue. The important point to keep in mind is just because I have drawn two FIFOs over here, one on each edge, doesn't necessarily mean that there's actually data sitting in any of them. Okay? Or in other words, one of them will always be empty. Right? And the reason we are saying one of them will always be empty is because there is only one token delay through this entire loop. Right? When I go from A to B and back to A, there is only one token delay. So at any given point in time, only one initial condition to work with. Either A is ready or B is ready. Both cannot be ready at the same time. Even though I have drawn FIFOs over there, they don't have any data in them. The FIFO can be empty. Okay. So with that in mind, we can then sort of, you know, expand this out still further and say the Khan process network is a very general model of computation, right? I can even have something of this sort. I can have something which says there is some A over here, another B over here, and both of them feed into C, which needs to do certain computation, okay? So the simple model of it is of course very easy to understand. I can just say I have FIFOs over here. But the interesting thing becomes when I can further associate a number with each of these edges, right? So let's say I have one over here and two over here. What does that number mean? It means that for C to execute, it needs to wait until there is at least one data present on A and at least two data values present on the B edge, B to C edge. Okay. So with this model, essentially what I'm saying is every time C executes, it consumes one token from A and two from B on each execution, on each firing. Okay. And interestingly, I could also have that, you know, the output of C I could associate some other number with it. Let's say that I put the number four. Okay. In which case it produces four tokens on its output. Okay. This is valid. I'm not saying that this is always to be done or anything of the sort, but having a token, uh, having a functional node C of this sort is perfectly valid. It's possible. I can model it using this framework right which means that I can then also create more complex networks over here I can have something which looks like there is an A it feeds into B it also feeds into something else C C in turn feeds into D both of them then combine back into E and so on okay Having a network of this sort is also possible because at the end of the day, all that I care about is there should be appropriate FIFO buffers everywhere. Right? Now, the interesting thing about this model is that it allows you to sort of do certain kinds of analysis on the system. Right? What kind of analysis? One of the main things that we would like to know in such a system is what should the sizes of those FIFO buffers be so that I don't run into problems? Right? So an example of what kind of analysis you could do would be how big should the FIFOs, how big or deep should the FIFOs be to avoid any kind of what's the problem that happens when a FIFO fills up and you still try writing to it, it's called overflow. Okay. 
so overflow is one problem deadlock is another problem is it possible for a particular network to deadlock okay these kind of questions within certain limited conditions can be answered using this model of con process networks okay not in general in general the answer to the question of is a con process network ever going to deadlock is it going is the fifo going to overflow there it may be possible to construct certain things in which you can't really answer that easily right but by putting some additional constraints on it you can actually answer those questions there are problems with that which is that the moment you start putting those additional constraints so that you can then answer the questions is the fifo ever going to overflow will it ever deadlock that also reduces the computational power of the system right one way you can think about it is one problem that you might have noticed already with these con process networks this kind of behavior is how do you model conditional behavior right if i wanted to say okay you know if some condition is satisfied do this okay the kpn model by itself allows that but the moment you bring in that kind of a conditional node you can no longer say anything about fifos because now it basically says okay you know a token may or may not arrive at a particular buffer okay so the network model itself is very general but what kind of analysis you can do and how you can sort of say whether or not it is going to work perfectly for your requirements usually requires you to put additional constraints on what can be modeled with it okay all right so let's just take a quick example to sort of get an idea of what we mean by this right the in fact this example that we talked about over here itself is a good one right i can straight away say that max size of f1 and f2 required what is the maximum required size how much is it one token storage right because there is only one d element over here one initial token right so at any given point in time i can either have one element on the fifo between a to b or from b to a not more than that so either one of those fifos just one is sufficient okay but what about this what should the max fifo size on this link be there is no bound okay there is no fundamental bound from the theory itself okay so effectively in other words what it's saying is because there is no dependency as such on a it is capable of generating outputs as and when required but if i don't put some kind of a physical limitation on how much data it can store then i am most likely going to run into problems by having a fifo overflow at some point okay so this is an example where the data flow graph or the network by itself does not impose a limitation on the size of the fifo or at least does not tell you anything about what should be the maximum size okay it does not bound the size of the fifo right one thing that you may sort of recognize by looking from whatever we have seen so far is in general it is safe to put larger and larger fifos you are not going to run into problems but why would you not want to do that hardware right basically each fifo involves some amount of hardware either it requires some memory for storing data or it requires physical registers shift registers etc which are also occupying space right so usually the question that we are interested in answering is what is the minimum size that i can get away with which will never lead to problems okay let's look at another similar uh, scenario over here just to sort of understand the nature of fifos supposing i have a network that looks like this right and i have two and one over here right so what are those two and one essentially saying that every time that a fires it produces two tokens and every time that b fires it consumes one token okay 
is this valid is this even acceptable what would you say is such a scenario possible is it possible to implement something of this sort yeah there's actually nothing preventing you from doing it right all that it means is a will produce tokens at a certain rate b is consuming only at half that rate which effectively means that every time that a fires b will have to fire twice to take out the data that it a generated okay but that's all there is to it right one way of thinking about this might be you know i have one in fact one simple way of looking at this would be i have a sort of parallel to serial converter right something which gives me 8 bits at a time and the output i want to generate as one bit serial data okay so a parallel to serial converter is exactly doing something of this sort every time that it fires it generates a whole lot of data which then has to be consumed by sort of eight firings of that parallel to serial converter okay what it means is that the firing rate or operating frequency or something operating frequency is not exactly the right term firing rate is actually the better way of understanding it but one way you can think about it is that the rate at which the operating frequency at which the other node b is operating has to be higher than what a is operating at okay so this kind of a system is usually called a multi rate system okay so a multi rate system this example that i have drawn over here just tells you why it is called multi rate because the rate at which b fires has to be higher than the rate at which a fires can they use the same clock frequency probably yes because keep in mind that the clock frequency at which a system operates is different from the rate at which the sample frequency or in other words the rate at which it pulls samples out of the system okay so all that i am talking about here is the rate at which it is processing samples i don't care about the internal clock frequency at which it is going to operate okay now let's draw another variant of this graph but now with feedback okay and okay what would you say is going to happen in this data flow graph let's sort of understand this a little bit better in terms of how it's i'll just redraw it quickly over here so that we can look at the firing sequences okay and i have two fifo buffers sitting over here okay initially how many data are sitting in this fifo zero and what okay let's say that i fire this graph once okay what does that actually mean it means basically that i look at all the nodes that are sitting over there i find out which one is ready and execute it okay So right now in the original state A is ready to execute because it has one token sitting on its input and according to that blue number written below A it means that it requires one token on input in order to execute what happens when it executes it consumes that one token and generates two outputs okay so i have two tokens sitting on that output fifo and zero sitting over here okay 
now what happens the next time now two tokens are sitting on the a to b edge b consumes one token every time that it fires therefore in principle it can now execute twice okay so let's just go ahead and execute both of them this comes down to 0 this goes to 4 ok so now 4 tokens are sitting on the b to a fifo which means a can now execute 4 times ok so you see where the problem is essentially what ended up happening was this sequence of this sort of set of values for the production consumption parameters is unstable okay so the FIFO will eventually overflow no matter how big you make it right no matter how big you make the FIFOs between AB and BA at some point if I carry on like this they will end up overflowing so even if I say okay you know I'm not going to execute both the B's at one time it doesn't matter there's still one token sitting on the A to B edge if I carry this on for a little while eventually I will definitely hit a point where both those FIFOs are growing without bound ok so I will never be able to sort of keep this under control in other words this particular all that it's saying is this is one possible KPN right a can process network but is invalid for the reason that it can essentially result in unbounded growth in the FIFO sizes ok so the purpose of all of this was to show how the KPN model can be used can sort of give you an indication of what the hardware corresponds to ok so we will just take it one step forward I am going to use this to define something called the axis stream interface right so the AXI or the this is essentially something called I think it is a uh, advanced extensible interface or something like that right this is essentially defined as a standard by the company arm along with others right it's more or less the standard interface bus that is used by arm processors these days okay arm I assume all of you have heard the name ARM at least, right? If you have a phone, it has an ARM processor inside it, okay? Even if you don't have a phone, you probably have an ARM processor sitting somewhere near you, okay? In fact, you have probably multiple ARM processors sitting inside any given phone that you have, right? It's to the point where ARM cores are so common that they are sometimes used embedded within chips in such a way that they can't even be directly programmed from the outside they are just used as controllers inside the chip ok so it's sort of the most common processor standard that exists at this point but that's irrelevant as far as we are concerned the important point is there is something called the they defined a bus standard we will get into more details on what buses are and so on later right but for the time being what is important is a bus is basically a way of getting data from A to B right from one computational point to another computational point or to memory now one particular sub specification of this AXI bus is something related to uh, the idea of streams it's called an AXI streaming interface right which has a very neat and simple definition so the stream interface is essentially related to the uh, Verilog example that you have been asked to implement which is basically the divider right the idea behind it is quite simple all that it says is any module that needs to perform computation when it requires input it takes it has three signals on that side one of them is the actual data itself that it wants to read there is another signal that it gets as input which basically says this is valid data Okay, so just because a set of wires is connected over there does not mean that the data present on it is valid. Okay, 
only when the previous stage that is telling you that is giving you the data says that the data is valid you should be able to read the data and do something with it right which is pretty much what is happening in the verilog divider example right whenever new data comes in it's after being read from a file somewhere right whenever new data comes in it is presented to your module along with a valid signal which goes high for one clock cycle okay what is your module expected to do it has to give out something called a ready signal right and the ready signal is basically indicative of this module is ready to accept new data okay which means that while you are processing the division you make the ready signal low right which basically tells the previous stage okay wait the next stage is not yet ready to accept data so don't advance your counter don't move on to the next data okay on the output side you can do exactly the same thing as and when you have finished your computation you give out data and in this case what you do is you wait to see whether the next stage where you are giving the data is ready right and along with the data you also output a valid signal okay so you can see that the valid on the incoming side is an input to your module the valid on the outgoing side is an output from your module the valid al always goes along with the data right so it in other words you have just associated one extra bit along with whatever data you are presenting which says whether or not the valid uh, data is actually valid at this point right the nice thing about having a design of this sort is i can have multiple modules that basically communicate like this right and automatically this these signals that we have over here right the data ready data valid ready take care of so called handshaking right and by just having some kind of a very simple finite state machine internally i can take care of making sure that all the data moves forward in a completely synchronized manner only when data is valid is it allowed to be consumed by the next stage and only when the next stage is ready to consume data will it actually take that data out and tell you that okay fine you know i have finished i have taken this out you can advance to the next data okay if you think about it internally this is also what a fifo does the fifo also gets a ready signal from the next stage into which it's feeding right and only when that next stage is ready that is it sends a read enable signal usually right which is basically the same as the ready signal the fifo will put that data at its output and advance its internal state basically saying okay you know i have one less piece of data stored inside the fifo i am closer to empty okay so physically in terms of hardware this is how you would implement it right the underlying model that is used to model any kind of signal processing computation is the kan process network the kan process network is in some ways a generalization of the idea of a data flow graph so what usually happens in practice is people introduce a number of extra constraints on kpn right so for example we have the core idea of data flow where for example conditional execution is not permitted right there is something else called synchronous data flow which actually allows you to model all those you know the previous scenarios where i could have multiple tokens being generated on each execution of an actor right there is something else called cyclostatic data flow which allows you to model periodic repetitions of certain computations right but all of those are essentially sort of extra constraints imposed on top of kpn so that it becomes analyzable and you can extract certain properties such as how big should a fifo be how much memory should i allocate etc okay all right so we'll stop here for now next time around what we are going to look at is we already saw from the description of the ir and fir filter that it looks as though when there is feedback there is a limitation on how low my iteration period is allowed to go in theory right how low is that let's try and actually derive that for a general arbitrary data flow graph
okay and then move forward to practical issues such as okay if i don't have infinite hardware but i still want to improve and get closer and closer to the ideal iteration period what are the different ways in which i can go about doing this okay